Yo, what's good? This is Dylan from Producer Grind. Big shout out to Red Bull Music for inviting us to their conversation with Coach K at Red Bull Music Festival Atlanta this month. For the few of you guys that might not know who Coach K is, he's actually one of the co-founders and COO of Quality Control Music. I know you guys know QC from their star-studded acts like Migos, Lil Yachty, Lil Baby, City Girls, the list goes on. The event was moderated by music journalist Christina Lee, and it was a two-hour conversation where she basically got Coach K to tell his entire come-up story, and he dropped a whole bunch of game along the way. We were actually the only media outlet that had access to come in and film this event, so I'm real excited to bring you guys this content. After filming the event, I came back, rewatched the entire thing about two times, and picked out the biggest gems that I felt like really sharing with the community, stuff that I really think you guys can learn a lot from. So what I'm gonna be doing is cutting to some of these short clips, and then I'm gonna come back on screen and just kind of give you guys a little backstory and just kind of expand on some of the lessons that I think you guys should be taking from some of the stuff Coach said. We're gonna go ahead and get it started with this first clip, which is actually from the first few minutes of the actual event, and it's basically where Coach K is kind of just explaining his background, how he grew up playing sports and he grew up as an athlete, and uh, just some of the things and lessons that he took from being an athlete and how it translated to his music career. So let's go ahead and get the first clip going. I learned a lot from it to the point like now, even the music, the way I approach everything, it's, it all comes from sports. Okay. It's, it's, it's like everything. So what's an example of a mannerism that you picked up from your coaches that you now like impart on, you know? I mean, game work? planning. I'm big on planning. Like I always tell the artists, like when we sign them, listen, this game that we in is a marathon, not a sprint. I believe in you so much and you give me your time and energy and you put the work in, I can take you through there and eventually turn you into a brand, you know? But it's all game planning, you know, like practice, practice, practice. You know, that's what makes you better. So in this clip right here, you guys pretty much seen the emphasis that Coach K puts on really planning and having a game plan for the music business or really any business in general. And I can relate this back to one of our most recent podcasts where we were talking to AD. We really kind of got into a conversation how there's a lot of producers that are just kind of out here winging it with no game plan. And yes, we have sat down with some guys like Young Keo and Cash Money AP who really kind of found a lot of success just, you know, winging it. But we know that for every one or two producers that does make it big without having a big plan, there's literally tens to hundreds of thousands of producers that end up failing. So it's very important to plan. And you know, in, in the beginning of our careers, we really don't have access to having a manager and someone with all the wisdom and knowledge that Coach K brings. So it's really up to us to play that role. And you need to be the one coming up with the plan and really strategizing for your career. And now in this next clip, Coach talks about how labels often chase numbers and how he really believes in building brands. So let's go ahead and play that clip. A lot of these labels are chase, they chase numbers. It's a numbers game with them, but they ain't building brands. Brands last longer than songs. And I tell every artist when we sign them, I was like, I'm real with them. I'm like, listen, you have an expiration date on yourself as an artist. Let's turn you into a brand. Because with, within that, with being an artist now with music, music touches everything. You know, whether it's fashion, whether it's Fortune 500 companies. If there's things that you can think about and you touch these people sonically, we can take that and create that into something else outside of music. So like I said, you know, this clip is all about, you know, really building your brands. And, you know, in this clip, he really is talking about artists, but we can really relate this back to producers as well. When you think about labels and artists chasing numbers, and you can think of those numbers as placements. A lot of these producers are out here chasing placements, trying to make these albums, trying to make these singles with these big artists and these up and coming artists. Yes, it is important to build your placement and publishing catalog, but it's also very important to be building your brand along the way. Now, if we look at the top producers in the last few years, guys have, that have really made it over the long haul, we look at guys like Metro Boomin, DJ Mustard, even OGs like Timberland and Dr. Dre. And you can't count out DJ Khaled. He's one of the most prominent producers that has really showed you the power of building your brand. As we build these relationships with artists, we really need to be leveraging those relationships to start obtaining ownership in songs and putting them out under our own name. We look at how Metro Boomin has put out songs and albums featuring the top artists in the game. Now, obviously a lot of us don't have access to these top artists, but we can start doing it with the artists and the relationships that we have, whether they have a big brand or not. You know what I mean? We can just kind of get into flow of putting out songs under our own brands. Now in this next clip, this one actually pertains a lot to producers. And Coach talks about early in his career when he was managing producers and some of the strategies that he used to start building relationships with artists and selling beats. So let's cut to that clip. When that whole Hindu situation happened, everybody just kind of split and went their own ways. So I started managing, I started managing producers. You know, I just still on my managerial thing and a &R thing. And I pretty much, I planned this shit out. I pretty much locked down every studio in the city, I had every studio manager's number in my phone and they would call me when new artists or artists would pull up to the studio. Okay. And I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but 
I would pull up with a producer and a nice grade of weed <laughs> for the artist to smoke. And that was my, you know, that's what I did. So <laughs> that's crazy. But we're getting real. You know, we're real in here. But I, I, re I remember, I remember Dewey, this, this, um, this kid from Indianapolis, he used to manage uh, Dallas Austin Studio. Dewey called me. He's like, dude, he said, you need to come up here. There's some young cats in here, man, with a lot of money. I said, oh, really? <laughs> he said, they've been up in the A room for like 30 days, man. I said, really? I'm on my way. So I, I called my man. I said, get your beats together, man. We're going to run up to the studio. I'm telling you, we're going to sell, you know, we're going to sell some beats. So, so with this clip, you got to think a little bit deeper. You see how Coach built relationships with managers of studios. And then what he would do is pull up to the studio with his producer and a little gift for the artist. So this gift doesn't have to be gas. You know what I mean? It could be anything. But just kind of just think of what the artist would like and something that you would like to receive. A little gift can go a long way. And this is actually a concept called the law of reciprocity that I picked up a while back reading a book called The Psychology of Influence by Robert Cialdini. And basically what he says is that when a human being is offered a gift, if there's an automatic trigger in the back of their mind that kind of just makes them feel the need to reciprocate that gift or kind of feel like they owe you one. And this is very powerful. And you can see this tactic being used like even at like a grocery store when you go and they give out free samples. Next time you go to the grocery store and you get a free sample, just kind of think about if you feel obligated to maybe even buy that product. You know, these grocery stores don't do that for a reason. They have high level marketing teams that really tap into these tactics. Now, I'm not saying to be fake and try to use tactics and all that stuff when you're trying to build your relationships because you got to be a genuine one person at the end of the day. A lot of people will see through the bullshit and you can't count out the fact that there are a lot of people that have read these books and know about these same tactics and, and they're going to be able to see a shark in the water. So like I said, if you are going to use these tactics, you have to be genuine about it and don't just do it for the sake of gain. What I also took from this clip is how when you are looking for a manager, you need to find someone that is thinking on the same level as coach was back then. He was out there putting in the footwork, building relationships with every studio in the city and pulling up on these artists. And you know, he also had a little bit of capital to fund it. Now you don't need a whole bunch of capital. Make sure you are picking someone that at least has some relationships believes in you and has the persistence to go out there and put in that same footwork. Now this next clip is really for artists, label owners, or people that manage artists on how Coach has utilized strip clubs in pretty much breaking every single artist that he's ever worked with. Let's check it out. I mean, the strip club was like our second home. You know, they would go play and I'd be in the DJ booth making sure DJ playing the music. And then you gotta find the girls, the popping girls that's in the strip club and make them your friends because they gotta put their playlist to the DJ for when they dance. They a and R's too. Some of the dopest A&Rs out here are strippers, I'm telling y'all. No, for real. Mm -hmm. So that's how it go. You go in there, okay, you take care of the DJ. You know, he gonna hit, he gonna hit it, you know, in between dances. But when them girls come do their sets, especially the main, the, the, the popping girls, mm -hmm. do they sets, when them boys gonna throw that money at them, you gotta make sure that they dancing. You gotta make sure when they come out and do their set, that your song is in that set. It's a system. So that was a tactic that y'all used with Jeezy? And... For sure. Okay. Now for Jeezy, Miko, for everybody. For everybody. I mean, that's, you know, that's, you know. That's a tried and true exactly. formula to success? Okay. Yes. Now, in this clip, I really like how Coach gave you some real game and a real tactic that you can use. I know pretty much everyone knows that strip clubs play an important role if you want to break some street music. But like I said, I really like how Coach went in depth and gave you a tactic that you can really start implementing. Now in this next clip, Coach talks about when he was managing Jeezy and he got to a point where he really needed to start getting Jeezy on the radio and how he was able to leverage certain brands and relationships to break through those barriers and get his artists on the radio. So let's check that one out. They had sent letters around to the radio stations. Blah, 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 blah. Cannot come in the radio stations. Wait, who's they? I don't know if it's the FI, whatever that. CC or CC, whatever? I don't know. Okay. There was letters sent around. They can't come in the radio station. So we we had a problem on getting our music played, which it wasn't a problem because with anything, the streets run it anyway. That was our plan from the beginning. But, you know, at the time, to get your music on the radio was everything. But then a blessing happened. And this is something I'm, I'm gonna give y'all some game on. I had did a deal with Jeezy at Def Jam. Shout out to Block Entertainment too. We always record at the same studio. And Block had this idea. He said, man, I wanna start this super group called Boys in the Hood, but I'm gonna go get Trick Daddy. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get T.I. I'm gonna, you know, he, he, that was his mind. Like, I'm gonna go get all these big, and I'm gonna put them in one group. Little did he know, 
we was working in the studio and it was super talents just sitting in that studio. You know, we start cutting records. Block ended up getting a deal with Puff, with Bad Boy, for this group called Boys in the Hood. It was kind of wild. Jeezy signed a Def Jam. How's that going to happen? Right, right. So, hey, I went and negotiated Def Jam to let Jeezy work this Boys in the Hood project. That's crazy. So he had two deals. At the with, same at the same time. time at the same damn time with wow. two different labels. So he was able to finesse his way in that way. Yes. Um, he had two deals. And, and then at, I met okay. and, and at the time Puff, you know, he shit, Puff ran radio. He didn't right. run radio, but his artists and music. Well, yeah. So he so that was that was really my way of like, oh shit. What you're saying now, yes. Okay. That's gonna get us on radio. Now on this one, you really gotta read between the lines because there's some high level game here. Coach was saying he was actually really reaching a ceiling and had some real barriers trying to get Jeezy on the radio. Now this is during the early 2000s when you know a lot of this music and, and if you had certain lyrics, you know, it was, it was really gonna hold you back from getting on the radio. Now he had Jeezy in a deal with Def Jam, but an opportunity came where he could get Jeezy signed to a group under Diddy. Now, like I said, this is back in the early 2000s, so you know, Diddy really had a lot going on. He had a lot of artists on the radio. He was coming off of a lot of big brand building like he did in the 90s for his label and himself, so he really had a lot of pull to get his artists on these radio stations. So I can't say for sure exactly how these conversations went, but I'm pretty sure he went to Def Jam and was like, look, we're both invested in this artist. Neither of us have the power to really break through those barriers, but we have an opportunity where if you give up a little bit of ownership over Jeezy's music career, we can leverage this relationship with Diddy, get him on the radio with Boys in the Hood, and then radio will see like, okay, this is an artist that we can trust and we can let be played on the radio. And you know, this just kind of goes back to the concept of would you rather have a big percentage of a little pie or a small percentage of a huge pie. It's really all about leveraging and really just kind of figuring out exactly what you need to do and making the right moves. So that wraps up my favorite clips and my favorite gems like Coach K dropped at the Red Bull Music Festival event in Atlanta. Like I said, big shout out to Red Bull Music for inviting us to the event. Big shout out to Coach K for dropping these gems. Be on the lookout for more content from us. Hit that subscribe. Peace.